Hi guys, it's Lucy. This week we're doing a little bit of a deep dive on Wolf Hall, which I finished earlier this week after dragging it out for about a month or so. Um, so first of all, this is book one of a trilogy. Um, I think two of the books in this trilogy won the Man Booker Prize. Um, all of them are now in paper pack. Um, I want to say right off the top that this book is not a movie. This is a whole season's worth on Netflix, in my opinion, that, and that's how dense it is. And when I try to read this book at the normal speed that I generally skim fiction um, books and nonfiction, I tend to read a little bit slower, but at my usual pace, I think I got lost um, during the first half of the book, like after about a page and a half. So I, I had to slow myself down to not miss all of the hilarious and very intelligent banter and a lot of the indirect insults being thrown around. There's a lot of winks um, here and there. So that, I think that's why it, it took me a while to get used to the pace of this book and the complexity and all of the cast involved. So it's really a, a very ambitious uh, piece of work. And so in line, um, in the same genre, historical fiction, one thing that I remembered um, coming to mind was, um, I think, Margaret George. I haven't actually read any of Margaret George's books, but um, a lady that I met randomly 10 years ago was um, extolling um, how much she loved Margaret George's novels. And at that time, I think I was reading another historical fiction um, in the same genre. So I looked that up. Margaret George has really good um, ratings on her various works, Henry VIII being one of them. I think she also has one on Mary, Queen of Scots, and um, Elizabeth I as well, um, and a whole host of other books that are also very highly rated. So in the realm of historical fiction, um, Margaret George came to mind, and another one, I think um, more recently, The Other Bullion Girl by Philippa Gregory. This one received really high reviews as well. Um, Obviously, historical fiction needs a really interesting subject, and Henry VIII is one of the most um, lived lives out there, that I, I would say. So uh, doing a quick research and with a sticky note, because his life is just, um, it's just too fast paced for me. So this follows Thomas Cromwell, and he rose to power during a very um, tumultuous time. This is when you know, you've got like a 30, 40 year old king with no heir to the throne and he can't divorce his wife and he's in love with this other woman and he, he wants to make this woman his wife and the Catholic Church says, no, you can't. So there's that whole um, love triangle dilemma, but, you know, <laughs> overcast that with political and religious um, powers at play. So what ended up happening is that he divorced his first wife um, and married um, Anne Boleyn and this is um, and doing that reforming the church and Thomas Cromwell the main character in this book um, was the one who sort of legalized that entire process or helped him build that entire um, process so that uh, Henry became you know the head of his own church and able to do whatever he wanted so Later on, what, how that ended up playing out was not that well for Anne Boleyn or Thomas Cromwell. Um, he, Boleyn ended up getting beheaded. Um, the third wife, Jane Seymour, ended up dying. And then the fourth wife ended up being annulled. So the fourth wife, Anne of Cleves, or Cleves, I don't know, a German princess, this was someone that um, Thomas Cromwell had introduced and set up based on what I read and that might be coming into play around the third book because with Anne Cleves, um, Henry um, Tudor was not happy at all and um, at that time I think so he was really interested in Catherine Howard who became his fifth wife but during that process around 1540 was when uh, Thomas Cromwell got beheaded himself and so he fell out of favor and um, eventually Catherine Howard had an affair of some sort and she got beheaded herself and 
um, whom, by the way, when she got married, she got um, a lot of Thomas Cromwell's land. But when she got um, beheaded, I'm not sure what happened after that, but the sixth wife, Catherine Parr, was the only one who, I suppose, outlived Henry. And just a byline, you know, she had four husbands herself. So another very interesting character out of all of these, I think I'm most interested in the background and life of Catherine Parr, to be honest. So out of all of these characters, a lot of Catherine's, a lot of Thomas's in this book that ended up all getting beheaded, um, Thomas Wolsey, who was the cardinal, and um, Thomas Cromwell's old master, uh, Thomas Cromwell himself, and Thomas Cranmore, and Thomas More, um, all of these were central figures in um, the political religious um, life um, surrounding Henry VIII. They all fell out of favor one way or another, I believe, specifically over the argument of religion and the applications of loss. And at the end of the day, it was all about the women in his life, right? So a very interesting subject and a very interesting approach and perspective. And I think it follows a lot of really um, popular, a lot of popular fiction lately in the market or that has come on to the market that were very enjoyable, that were written from the perspective of, say, a secondary character. So topic-wise, not the same. But what I'm thinking about is Madeline Miller's Circe and Achilles. Um, so Achilles was written from the perspective of um, Patroclus, who, you know, no one has, no one really um, follows him as a main character, but it was written from his perspective and tells the unique side, um, well, a fictional perhaps, an elaborated fiction, but very interesting from a secondary character. Circe, similarly, everyone knows about Odysseus and how he, um, you know, traversed the ends of the world and trying to get back home. But Circe, um, and is usually kind of mentioned as a just you know a witch character that kept um, Odysseus on her island for an extended period of time. But written from Circe's own perspective about her life, her upbringing, all of that is fascinating and includes some other main characters like um, that we normally wouldn't have thought about. So similar, um, Henry VIII and Elizabeth I all are all very central figures, but Thomas Cromwell, for me at least, was a very interesting um, study, fictionally, as we'll dive in a little bit further into, but also um, just historically looking at exactly um, how his line ended up. So um, I want to mention one point just on the writing, just on a literary basis, so I'll, I'll put this up um, on the slides. I really appreciate it. I'll, it's a very thick book, but everything is extremely compact, very well thought out, and very well written. And this passage sort of proves that. So this is the moment when um, Thomas Cromwell was reflecting on the death of his old master, Thomas Wolsey, the cardinal. So um, he thinks, um, another man would go to Leicester and see where he died and talk to the abbot. Another man would have trouble imagining it, but he has no trouble, he being Cromwell. The red of a carpet's ground, the flush of the robin's breast or the chaffinch, the red of a wax seal or the heart of the rose implanted in his landscape, seared in his inner eye and caught in the glint of a ruby, in the color of blood, the cardinal is alive and speaking. Look at my face, I am not afraid of any man alive. On the face of it, it's a little bit of a quizzical passage. So um, the context here being he was told that the Cardinal's last words were, look at my face, I am not afraid of any man alive. This is a strong statement, but this passage hit me and I felt like it was escalating, like fists slamming on a table, but I wasn't sure why it was that way. And because when we look at the subjects that he's mentioning, they don't make sense. You know, carpets, ground, some birds, breasts, wax, rose, ruby, blood. It, it's it's kind of all over. The tying, the uniting thing being um, various words describing color, right? So we have red, um, rose, ruby, and the color of blood, obviously. But red, um, 
is not just the cardinal's color as we know that's that's very explicit because red um, based on the laws at that time was only reserved for persons of very high social standing like mem- nobility or um, uh, members of the council the king's council so that is the explicit uniting thing that being the color but it's gradual in the sense that it's literally building up the character, the man himself, up to his face. So um, from the ground, so the carpet's ground, that being the ground, the base of, of, the, of the person, I suppose. And then it mentions the breast. And then the next um, segment of the passage starts talking about the heart. So you're gradually moving up. And then after the heart, it's talking about um, the glint, which is more talking about the eye, and then in the last uh, sentence referring to his actual quote, look at my face. So from the ground up to the breast, to the eye, to the entire face, that's why it felt like um, punches. A very powerful passage, kind of like um, a man not dying, you know, withering away in that sense, which is which might be what another person uh, would have felt like pity, right? This dying this way is the antithesis of of pity. So it's more like I, um, I, I I'm not afraid of anything. Yeah, exactly. I'm not afraid of any man alive. Um, in a, in a, in a way beating all of them. So from a literary perspective, just breaking down a passage like that, you can see how, I think, how well written and well thought out everything is. And that applied to a lot of the conversations and observations of dances, of dinners, of normal conversations, of own, Thomas' own um, observations of other people. That's why it took longer to read this book than your normal fiction, um, from my perspective. So um, so that was about the writing itself. And next, um, I, what I found interesting was his rise to power and the way that the author kind of fictionalized it and describes it, described it. So this is a man who did not come from nobility. He came from, you could say trade, but he eventually ended up being a policymaker and a lawyer. So definitely a guy of many talents but his first post was with what i think is the equivalent of um the king's treasury so how where did all the king's money come from where did it go so he really made money his business and he's very business minded in that sense and he you know here he's educating like some duke he's saying how can he explain to him the world is not run from where he thinks not from his border fortresses not even from Whitehall. The world is run from Antwerp, from Florence, from places he has never imagined, from Lisbon, from where the ships with sails of silk drift west and are burned up in the sun. I think he's talking about the new world, the wealth of the new world. Um, not from castle walls, but from counting houses, not but counting houses being the earlier version of houses. Um, not by the call of the bugle, but by the click of the abacus, not by the grade and click of the mechanism of the gun, but by the scrape of the pen on the page of the promissory note that pays for the gun and the gunsmith and the powder and shot. And another passage just on his view of money. Um, which he's using money in the best way possible, which is not just to make more money and build wealth, but he's using it as a a tool to, a key to power that will grant him that that wealth that, you know, today we call wealth building, but he's using it in in an even more ingenious way, I think. So um, he's saying uh, he watches the king dancing with Lizzie Seymour, his hand lingering on her waist and then etc. And then he says, next day he lends Edward Seymour, which is Lizzie's father uh, or brother, maybe, um, some money on very favorable terms. So he ends up being the creditor of a lot of these nobility and if not directly, then indirectly controlling their finances and their actions, as in what they could do, what they could not do. 
um, if say Thomas More is writing out pamphlets that are saying that he is against the Church of England and he's getting them printed in Germany or um, Italy or wherever, he has all of these printers in his pockets and he's controlling, he's telling them, don't print anything from Thomas More. Otherwise, you'll lose all my business or I'll call on you know, your credit and all of your creditors who are inevitably all of his friends um, and make life very difficult for, for merchants. So he has ways to everybody, um, some sort of way. So, but there is a note here that I think is quite insightful is that money um, in this world, in, his, in this world where you know, there were a lot of opportunities, went very far for him, obviously. It got him um, a lot of land. He became uh, a baron. Um, but there were some things that um, you could not really buy with money, and this, is, and this is one of those things. So he says, this is the whole difficulty of dealing with them. Men who are always talking about ancient pedigrees and boyhood friendships and things that happened when you were still trading wool on the Antwerp exchange. You put the evidence under their noses and they start getting teary over snowball, snowball fights. Um, so this is, you know, him being a businessman, he thinks one is one, two plus two equals four. If this guy is doing this, then you should just ditch him. But, you know, they, with ancient pedigrees and boyhood friends, the king is lingering over these snowball fights of, remember when so-and-so did a throw, threw a... I don't know, threw a snowball at, at so-and-so, and that was a really nostalgic moment. So it's things, he's, he thinks that, you know, money and hard evidence should get the results, but sometimes it doesn't, right? It's relationships, he finds that the relationships are sometimes overriding um, the influence that he has built directly on hard dealings and money being the result um, of that. So that's a very interesting point I found. Um, him being having fallen out of favor by 1940, and um, when he gets beheaded, so when someone gets beheaded, all of their titles go away. But what I found interesting after a quick Wikipedia was that his son actually got granted the same title. So that was quite. I don't know what. I'm not sure exactly how that was done, but I think that couldn't have been easy. And the, the, when his son Gregory got back the title, um, that line continued for about a hundred-ish years when, you know, the barons of Cromwell fully died out. So for a hundred years, his descendants were nobility, um, and especially his son, who was able to survive his downfall and still be in favor enough to be granted the same title back. So here is a little bit on his thinking and his education that the author has um, thought out that I thought was a really cool thing worth mentioning. Um, this is one of the truths of the world, I suppose. So, so this is when he took Gregory to visit to marry the first princess, so the princess, um, the daughter from the first queen. And at this time, no one went near Mary because it was not Princess Mary, it was Lady Mary. So she was not a she, her title was revoked because Anne Boleyn became queen and Elizabeth her daughter um, is the only princess and so Mary was just sort of um, at this time I think we can imagine it well that she is a little bit of an inconvenience for everybody but this is exactly the time that when Mary has been shunted off to some countryside house um, and no one is is you know wanting to go near her. Thomas Cromwell takes his son and goes, and um, at the end of the day, he he tells Gregory, you know, what do you think would happen if the king died tomorrow? And and he continues to say, it's all very well planning what you will do in six months, what you will do in a year, but it's no good at all if you don't have a plan for tomorrow. How realistic is that? And how many parents would actually? Um, educate their kids like that. And this is a very hard, like, um, very hard truth because at this time, um, you brought these characters around and the world is quite black and white, like life or death. If you're on the wrong side, you could be out of favor forever. 
um, with a king who obviously is not very shy about sending people to their tower to to their death, um, if not indefinitely to the tower. Um, so this illustrates some of his thinking, which I think wouldn't be too far from the truth. This is obviously a guy who schemes a lot, who thinks a lot. And there was another example when you know he was in charge of decorating um, the new queen's chambers, and he says, you know, for the wall murals, we don't want any of the regular saints and um, virgins and all of that because of its obvious ties to Catholicism, which you know Henry is very busy overthrowing at the moment. So he says instead we're going to have um, the Greek. Um, goddesses. We're going to have Artemis, we're going to have the Muses, we'll have Athena, and all of them are going to have dark eyes because Anne Boleyn had dark eyes. And as he was describing that moment, he also thought um, that the author kind of elaborated, you know, what happens if one day we don't have this queen? What, what happens when our king is in love or is married to another woman and she has blue eyes? And he thinks, okay, well, then at that point, we're just going to have to take out these <laughs> these faces and remake them with blue eyes. Obviously a very dangerous thing to, uh, to if he said this out loud, that would have been not good. But the fact that he thinks so far in advance and he's able to think of these potential branches of you know possibilities of where things could be tomorrow, five years, ten years, his it shows the <laughs> the level of just non-ending um, planning that goes on. And all of it is very realistic and very strategic. And I think there's one phrase that sort of summarizes um, this character's life and the way that um, the author approaches this book and this character herself, which I think I would like to end this video with. So. Um, this is another thought within his own head, and this is a guy who, by the way, is probably one of the most ugly <laughs> courtiers there were, um, and the portraits um, sort of reflect that as well. Um, a very rough looking son of a blacksmith, and so she says, well, um, the author says through Cromwell, suppose within every book there is another book. And within every letter, on every page, another volume constantly unfolding. But these volumes take no space on the desk. Suppose knowledge could be reduced to a quintessence held within a picture, a sign, all within a place which is no place. Suppose the human skull were to become capacious, spaces opening inside it, humming chambers like beehives. That's what I feel reading, you know, page after page of interactions and the planning and the rise of um, Cromwell and the fall of everybody else is that if you were to open his brain, it would be humming not like a beehive, but like a very high horsepower <laughs> engine. Um, so I think that's pretty high praise, no doubt to say that I think this will be one of my um, favorite books of, of the year. Um, I think I need a break before reading the second and third one though, because the rise is very exciting, but I think the fall, um, because now I've, I feel like I'm invested in this character, and I know that eventually he's going to get beheaded himself, and that the desperation might impact me a bit, a bit too much. I think I need to prepare myself a little bit more. So I hope you enjoyed the ranting, and um, if you get around to reading Wolf Hall or um, Margaret George or any of the other books that I mentioned, especially um, Madeline Miller, that those are um, very good reads as well. Uh, let me know. I'd be happy to know um, what you thought about all of these. Thanks for watching, and have a good week.